ZIS-110, launched into production right after the war, became a true breakthrough for the Soviet Union, a country that had endured the most devastating conflict in its history managed, in just two years, to master the production of a top-class automobile. But how did it happen that Stalin's main limousine turned out to be a copy of the American Packard? Today, we'll tell this story. The idea of creating a Soviet luxury car first emerged in the early 1930s during the wave of rapid industrialization. A prestigious limousine was expected to become a natural addition to the country's growing achievements in engineering. New cars, tractors, tanks, and airplanes. As in many other fields, foreign influence played a significant role. Some historians believe that Joseph Stalin himself encouraged these first steps. In 1933, six experimental cars named Leningrad I were assembled at the Krasny Putilovets plant in Leningrad. Their prototype was the American Buick 3290 of 1932. The choice was deliberate. Stalin's beloved Packard and its rival Cadillac both belonged to the very top tier of the American market too large and expensive for Soviet needs. The Buick, however, occupied the upper middle class segment, making it a more suitable model to adapt. The goal was not to create a government car, but to master the production of a relatively large, comfortable, and potentially serial automobile. In fact, the L1 turned out to be almost a direct copy of the Buick 3290. But this was not considered shameful. On the contrary, Soviet newspapers openly referred to it as the Soviet Buick. At first, the timing seemed favorable. In the early 1930s, the Krasny Putilovets plant had discontinued the production of Fords and tractors, which freed up space. But the factory lacked the capacity for car mass production, as well as the skilled workforce needed for such complex machines. The plant was not modernized for passenger car production. Instead, it was reassigned to a more familiar task, the manufacture of T-28 tanks. From that point on, the factory focused on tractors and armored vehicles, while further development of the L-1 project was transferred to Moscow, to the ZIS plant. The idea of producing a representative limousine was well-received at the plant. Moreover, it was supported by the director of ZIS, Ivan Likachev. For him, and for the Moscow factory, the launch of a top-class car was an ambitious task that would raise the prestige of the enterprise. With backing from the leadership, work began in Moscow in 1934 on the creation of a government limousine. In the spring of 1936, two prototypes of the ZIS-101 were built. On April 29th, they were presented in the Kremlin to Stalin and Orjonikidze. The factory workers were nervous, but the leaders were in good spirits. Orjo Nikidza assured Stalin that the car was no worse than its American counterparts, something the Soviet leader was pleased to hear. Stalin inspected the limousine carefully. A car built in the American style clearly intrigued him. In the end, he gave his approval. It is said that Stalin himself suggested using a star with a red banner as the car's emblem. On November 3, 1936, the first production batch was assembled, and on January 18, 1937, full conveyor production began. The fate of the ZIS-101 turned out to be complicated. The cars carried not only senior officials, but also many other passengers. The reason lay in the model's serious shortcomings, both technical and production-related. The factory's assembly line, which struggled even with trucks, could not ensure the precise assembly of a limousine with a wooden frame. Most cars began to creak almost immediately and the rest developed noises once the wood dried. The design and assembly methods were so complex that workers often performed tasks carelessly. The cars had to be refined after leaving the line. At first, the limousines were sent to the special purpose garage, but they did not take root there. They could not compete with imported vehicles. Later, the ZIS-101 was handed over to the NKVD's operations garage for escort duty, but even there it proved unsuitable. Eventually, the cars were distributed to regional committees, people's commissariats, and embassies. Rejected by the top leadership, the ZIS-101 came closer to the people. It was never sold freely on the market, 
However, beyond middle and lower ranking officials, the cars were allocated to scientists and cultural figures. One of them belonged to the writer Alexei Tolstoy. In the pre-war years, the limousine was even included as a prize in the state lottery, at least on paper. More realistically, one could ride in a ZIS 101 as a taxi passenger. In large cities, they were used on long routes. The ZIS 101, as we would say today, did not catch on with either Stalin or the Soviet leadership. Until the war, Stalin continued to use Packard limousines, but the desire to have a Soviet-made official car never disappeared. Work on a new limousine began right in the middle of the war, in 1942. The choice of prototype was decided immediately. The main Soviet car had to resemble a Packard. Interestingly, by the early 1940s, Packard's once prestigious reputation in the United States was already fading. The company was struggling to compete with larger automakers. But Stalin's fondness for Packard's outweighed all other considerations. In appearance, the ZIS 110 clearly resembled the last pre-war model, the 1942 Packard 180 Super 8. Yet not a single body panel was interchangeable. The Soviets copied the style, even the decorative trim, but proportions and details were different. It was not a replica, but an imitation. One visible difference was the absence of spare wheels on the fenders. On the Packard, they looked outdated, so the ZIS designers moved them into the trunk. The wide running boards were also abandoned. Underneath, however, the ZIS frame was almost identical to the American one. A heavy structure with an X-shaped crossmember, and even the layout of the exhaust system and the battery matched in detail. The engine, too, followed the Packard design. It was an inline eight-cylinder with a displacement of six liters. Bore and stroke measured 90 by 100 millimeters. Power output was 140 horsepower at 3,600 revolutions per minute, a record for Soviet passenger cars at the time. But the American engine produced up to 165 horsepower at the same speed. By Soviet standards, the interior of the ZIS-110 was luxurious. Soft, cloth-covered seats, a clock, and even a radio. The instruments, with their elongated scales, looked striking. They were copied almost exactly from Packard, right down to the typeface of the speedometer. The only difference was that the American dial read in miles, while the Soviet one was in kilometers. Some viewers might be tempted to smile. So what? They copied a foreign car. Nothing remarkable. But context matters, both the time and the circumstances. ZIS 110, like most Soviet cars, was a compromise between ambition and reality. The country, still fighting a brutal war and lacking extensive experience in passenger car production, could hardly create a completely original design in such a short time, a timeline unthinkable for the Soviet industry of later decades. Adapting a foreign model to local production and operating conditions was already a major achievement, especially since the choice of prototype was made by the country's supreme leader, and no one would have dared to argue with him. When development of the ZIS-110 began, the Battle of Stalingrad was underway. By the time it was presented in the summer of 1944, Operation Bagration had just begun on the Eastern Front, while the Allies were landing in Normandy. Germany had already lost the strategic initiative, but its forces were still present in Soviet territory. Nearly a year of exhausting battles remained before the Reich finally surrendered. In 1945, only 34's as 110 limousines were produced. Yet the car immediately became a symbol of a new peaceful life. It was not just a car, but a huge luxurious limousine, gleaming with chrome. Naturally, it was intended for party and government leaders. But there was at least one exception. Along with a cash prize of 500,000 rubles, the cost of 55 Moskvich cars, Igor Kurchatov, the father of the Soviet atomic bomb, received a ZIS-110 as a personal gift. Of course, it was meant to be driven by a chauffeur. Men of such stature rarely sat behind the wheel themselves. Kurchatov received the award after the first successful atomic bomb test in 1949. But immediately after the war, top officials did not adopt the ZIS-110. 
To meet their requirements, an armored version was necessary. Development of the armored model began almost in parallel with the standard car. The first prototype, designated Ziz-111, looked almost identical, distinguished only by a third central headlamp and more pronounced wheel covers. The armored capsule weighed 1,210 kilograms, bringing total curb weight to 4,670 kilograms, nearly double the standard Ziz 110's 2,573 kilograms. The frame, suspension, and hubs had to be reinforced, and special tires were developed. Even so, they barely supported the weight. Because of this excessive mass, the project was deemed a failure. All examples were sent to China, and Stalin, angered by the waste of time and money, scolded those responsible. The second attempt was more successful. The Ziz 110 SO, soon renamed Ziz 115, had lighter armor, reducing weight by about half a ton while maintaining protection. It passed rigorous tests, including close-range gunfire, and proved reliable. The first Ziz 115 rolled out in 1949. These were the cars that carried Stalin and other Politburo members. The first examples were also exported, three to China, two to Korea. Later, armored Ziz limousines were sent to leaders of Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Vietnam, and even to King Zahir Shah of Afghanistan. Production ended in 1950, as the Kremlin's garage was well supplied. But in 1953, manufacturing briefly resumed, likely to replenish the fleet reduced by frequent diplomatic gifts. After Stalin's death, the Ziz 115 was still used, even by Nikita Khrushchev, especially on foreign trips. Khrushchev openly criticized the very idea of an armored limousine, insisting he had no reason to hide from the people. Indeed, he often appeared in public, riding in open-top Ziz 10B cars alongside honored guests, passing through dense crowds. Such scenes, at home and abroad, became one of the symbols of the Khrushchev thaw, a time of greater openness. The Ziz 115 remained in production, with interruptions, until 1955, while the standard Ziz 110 continued until 1958. By the mid-1950s, however, work had already begun on a new government limousine for the new general secretary. From that point on, the Soviet leadership went nearly three decades without armored cars. The issue was not raised even after the 1969 assassination attempt on Leonid Brezhnev. On that occasion, a Soviet army lieutenant, Ilyin, opened fire on the motorcade, mistakenly targeting a car carrying cosmonauts. The only casualty was Ilya Zharkov, a driver for the Kremlin's special garage, who was at the wheel of a Zil 111. Nevertheless, the Ziz 115s remained in full working order and were kept in reserve. The last armored limousine was officially retired only in 1994. Some were scrapped, but many survived. Today, several can be seen in museums and private collections. Seeing Stalin's limousine is not difficult, but riding in one is another matter. The Ziz 110, being more common, has survived in greater numbers than its armored counterpart. Its very last service came in 1985, when a Ziz 110SO was used in a crash test. The data from this experiment was essential in the development of the new armored Zil 4105. With no other comparable vehicles available, the old limousine provided the only reference. After 30 years, the Soviet leadership had finally returned to armored cars. But that is another story.